punctuation questions can be tricky, but they don't have to be. My goal today is to simplify the way that we approach punctuation questions, even the seemingly daunting ones. I hope that by the end of this video, you'll be able to spot the five mistakes in this intro. Let's get started. So how do we solve punctuation questions? Well, there are a couple ground rules that I want to lay out that we can apply to punctuation questions as a whole. The first is that you should pronounce the punctuation marks. I know for some that might sound strange, considering that we think of punctuation marks as silent, but they are meant to represent a pause or short breath in the sentence where they occur. So by exaggerating the pause or simply by pronouncing them sort of obviously, you'll be able to eliminate some answer choices and punctuation questions for sounding awkward or having too frequent pauses. The other rule, each punctuation mark has its own clause rules that it must follow. There are certain do's and don'ts associated with each one, beginning with the comma. So for commas, commas are extremely versatile punctuation marks. There is one thing that we're not allowed to do though. Now, if you use, if you create an independent clause in a sentence and then a comma and insert another independent clause, that would create something called a comma splice. This is a mistake. A comma splice is a type of run-on sentence, meaning that this sentence has more than one independent clause in it and that they're not joined properly. This is the mistake that you should look out for in punctuation. I see it all the time. Now, comma fanboys and semicolon share very similar rules. Both of them require an independent clause before and after. So the opposite of the comma. Where the comma could not connect to independent clauses, the comma fanboys must, and the semicolon as well must. Now, colons, I know that we're familiar, most of us have probably heard that they have something to do with lists. Um, as far as their clause rules go, it's really important to remember that they must be preceded by an independent clause. So if you see a sentence where replacing the colon with a period would result in the part before that sounding strange, you shouldn't use the colon there. The other property of colons is that they introduce information that's extrapolating on what the initial independent clause was talking about. So very often you should be able to replace the colon with the phrase, let me tell you why, let me tell you what, or let me tell you how. And if that sets up the following information, then the colon is likely appropriate. Finally, we have everyone's favorite, the dashes. I think of dashes as parentheses, meaning you use them to surround pieces of information in a sentence that you think can be deleted. In other words, they're markers of extraneous or non-essential sentence components. So let's see if we can solve some punctuation questions. So first up, after returning home following a long day of classes, I realized that I'd forgotten something at school. It was my wallet. Well, answer choice A is definitely incorrect. Answer choice A contains that comma splice that's so commonly associated with punctuation questions. You'll notice that on the left of it, I realized well, is enough to constitute an independent clause. Whereas on the right of it, it was, is also enough to constitute an independent clause. This would mean that this answer choice is a comma splice and cannot be correct. For answer choice B, just like we learned earlier, semicolons and comma fanboys have sort of an opposite rule from commas. So whereas the comma requires that you can never connect to independent clauses, the semicolon requires you to. That means that answer choice B, at least from a grammatical perspective here, seems to check out. Answer choice C could also work because the clause rule associated with colon demands that the portion of the sentence preceding the colon is an independent clause, which it is. I realized I had forgotten something at school. There is a second component of colons, however, that helps us a lot in this situation. The second component is that you should be able to replace the colon with a period followed by the phrase, let me tell you why, or let me tell you what. That connects the information between these two independent clauses quite well, in my opinion. Let's try it out. I realized that I'd forgotten something at school. Let me tell you what. It was my wallet. Now, 
Given that in answer choice C, both of the criteria for colon, the independent clause preceding it, and then also the let me tell you why or what phrase working, considering that both of those criteria worked, I'm inclined to, to lean toward more towards answer choice C. Because while answer choice B was grammatically correct, semicolon is not able to effect that sort of let me tell you why or let me tell you what feeling in a sentence. With Andrew Joyce D, we could make the case that this is also grammatically correct if you were to interpret this dash as an end of sentence parentheses, meaning it begins at uh, prior to the word it and ends following the word wallet. This is what I was mentioning earlier about an end of sentence parentheses potentially being uh, misleading due to the fact that it only seems to have one dash. As we know now, that second dash is simply being replaced by the period at the end of the sentence. As I was saying earlier, answer choice B seems grammatically correct, C seems fine, and D also seems grammatically correct. However, in this particular case, given that answer choice C is able to fulfill both criteria of a colon, this would be the ideal answer choice. I think it's C. Onwards. With the finish line in sight, the runner hurtled forward with renewed intent, eliciting gleeful cheers from his supporters and exasperated groans from his competitors. Interesting thing happened there, I think, when I read it. I, I'm already leaning towards answer choice A. As I read that sentence, the, the way that I voiced that sentence changed when I encountered the and exasperated groans from his competitors portion of the sentence. I, I feel as though my tone lowered slightly. Now, typically when that happens, that's an indication that you're encountering uh, parentheses. And I think that's exactly what's going on in this case. So in this sentence, it, I think that the main portion of the sentence would be the, with the finish line in sight, the runner hurtled forward with renewed intent, eliciting gleeful cheers from his supporters. I know that that's a combination of clauses, but I'm trying to isolate the main portion of the sentence from the parentheses or everything else in the sentence from the parentheses. And I think that the parentheses would include and exasperated groans from his competitors. Now, one thing that I want to point out is that very often when you're solving punctuation questions, the before you allow yourself to be led by the answer choices, it can be very helpful to sort of try to complete or to fix the sentence on your own. So many times I'll, I'll simply read the sentence that involves the punctuation question. Uh, with an eye for whether or not I think that there's anything wrong to, with it and how I might potentially fix that mistake if there is one. That's why when I was reading this one just now, uh, after finishing reading the sentence, I, I thought that answer choice A looked nice because I didn't detect any uh, grammatical mistakes that stood out to me. But of course, we got to try all the answer choices, so we'll try B. Uh, eliciting gleeful cheers from his supporters, exasperated groans from his competitors, this happens a lot in punctuation questions where uh, sometimes students will think that two answer choices are similar. Like some students might think that B is quite similar to A, but we want to make sure that we're checking to see what was underlined in each answer choice. So in A, if they're underlining the and, then it's not going to carry over into B, meaning that B ought to be re read without the word and in it. If you read it without the word and in it, it sounds as though it's describing the supporters as exasperated groans. And last time I checked, people are not groans. And so I'm pretty sure B is wrong. Uh, C, let's see, eliciting gleeful cheers from his supporters and exasperated groans from his competitors. Nice, it's a classic semicolon mistake where uh, semicolon would require you to have two independent clauses before and after. And I think this is a nice uh, opportunity to clarify something, which is that when you're using a semicolon, it doesn't have to have a, an independent clause directly before it. It just has to be some point in the sentence before it. And same thing with after it. It won't necessarily have to be directly after it. It could be uh, you know, buffered by like a dependent clause or something like that. It, it would just have to be somewhere eventually in the sentence. In this case, uh, with the placement of the semicolon, there isn't really a lot of option for what would come after it. So it makes it quite easy to analyze. It would simply say, and exasperated groans from his competitors. This is not an independent clause. And so C cannot be correct. And I, I can already see D from the corner of my eye, but it, it really, it has the, the sense of a 
comma splice answer choice. Let's see what's happening here. The runner hurtled forward with renewed intent, eliciting gleeful cheers from his supporters, comma, there were. Now, there were, following that eliciting clause, is already enough for me to establish that there's an independent clause coming up. There being the subject and were being the verb is already all of the information I need to tell that D is a comma splice. So hey, moving on. The ominous clouds coupled with the foreboding sounds of distant thunder served as a constant reminder to seek cover. Interesting. Another, another sentence where upon reading it, I wasn't able to detect uh, any mistakes. Nothing really stood out to me. So I, I'm sort of leaning favorably towards answer choice A already. Let's try B. Uh, I can already see that there's a plethora of commas being sprinkled throughout these answer choices, B, C, and D. And so this brings to mind the pause rule of punctuation. That being that punctuation marks need to be pronounced. They should be read as a pause or a short breath. So if we were to read answer choice B correctly, it would sound like the ominous clouds coupled with the foreboding sounds of distant thunder served as a constant reminder to seek, and I'm already, I already feel as though that was quite awkward and I don't think the answer is B. Let's try C. The ominous clouds coupled with the foreboding sounds of distant thunder served as a constant reminder, I don't think so. And then D, the ominous clouds coupled with the foreboding sounds of distant thunder served as a constant reminder to seek cover. This is A, answer choices B, C, and D. While not containing any grammatical mistakes, uh, strictly speaking, sounded extremely awkward. So let's go with A. All right, last one. Considering that they had arrived at the store just before the end of the holiday sale, the students were surprised to find numerous gifts still lining the shelves. Many of them appeared completely untouched. A is unfortunately incorrect. So this sentence, once again, we see the comma splice making its appearance. We had an independent clause earlier consisting of the students were surprised and then an independent clause directly following the comma after shelves. So many of them appeared. One thing to note is that I mentioned earlier that some punctuation questions don't resemble punctuation questions in the sense that their answer choices don't contain punctuation marks necessarily. And this is a good example of that type of question. I think many people might look at this question and be a little confused as to what exactly it is that the SAT wants from them. But they sort of were kind enough to give us a clue here in these answer choices, that being in the form of which in answer choice D. Now, which, if you use it in a sentence to refer back to something that was mentioned already, this is called a relative pronoun. And relative pronouns will begin dependent clauses. So it seems very uh, noteworthy to me that answer choice D for some reason is providing me with the option of beginning a dependent clause. This makes me think that clauses are somewhat involved, somehow involved in the solving of this question, which would make it a punctuation question. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I think that the punctuation mark that's uh, the most important or the important punctuation mark in this question, I think is the one following shelves and you notice that it's sort of hidden there. It's not really underlined. The, the answer choices would go after it, but I think that the sort of crux of this que question is that sort of sneaky little comma there. So like I was saying, answer choice A, we know is a comma splice now, two independent clauses to the left and right. Uh, B would not fix the problem on the right. We would still have many appeared, which would still be a subject verb combination. C, same problem. They appeared would still be a subject verb combination resulting in a comma splice. And D, containing the relative pronoun, D would start a dependent clause after the comma, which means that our sentence here is now intact. So we had a, an independent clause to the left of this comma followed by a dependent clause. No more comma splices. The answer is D. One more thing before we go. Do you remember those five mistakes that I mentioned were in the intro? Do you think you can find them? For more practice problems like this and access to a 24 seven online practice tool, check out ACIT at the link below. ACIT is the ultimate study tool for the SATs and ACTs created by Juni Learning, an award-winning educational tech company that's helped thousands of students take their learning to the next level. 
Get a one week free trial when you use the link in the description. Happy testing.